Hello everybody, welcome to the Boxing Science Podcast. This is episode four and today we're going to be talking about strength training. I've got with me my colleague Alan Ruddock. Alan, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. As usual, just cracking on with things, uh, putting a bit of routine together just to get through the day, um, but all good. For, the, for those that aren't watching on YouTube, Mercy are going to be listening to the audio format. Our hair is going out of control. Alan's got the biggest quiff going. It was a, uh, it was a toss up today between the big quiff or holding everything in with a with my daughter's Alice band. I think you, I think you need to go to David Beckham two thousand and three look. You know when he signed for Real Madrid. Yeah, and he had shaved <laughs> all down there. Yeah, that yeah. <laughs> okay, so this podcast we don't just talk about hair uh, and lockdown. Uh, we talk about. Uh, sports science in boxing and combat sports and today we're going to go into um, like one of our more structured episodes around a certain topic and today we're going to be talking about strength training which is getting more and more popular within boxing you know we've been around boxing since uh, 2012 and the level of strength conditioning is increasing is improving and you know you might be listening to this you might have a good idea of of why you do strength training. Uh, some of you might do strength training but not know the reasons why and how to structure that. And so today's episode is all around giving the scientific evidence of why strength training is so important and how we implement like strength training methods to work towards a purpose but also work around the limitations that boxing has because there's certain things like movement, there's weight restrictions, there's high training loads in boxing and conditioning, loads of things that we need to compete with as strength and conditioning coaches. First of all, Alan, uh, as we start with everything that we do, we start with a scientific purpose. So when we're looking at strength training for boxing, we want to know what contributes to a forceful punch. So we, we'll kick start with the science behind the punch. Yeah, so... <clears throat> if we're thinking about how best to improve physical performance, then we really need to try and reverse engineer what makes a successful performer. Um, and in boxing and combat sports, it's what makes an effective punch. So I guess number one, the coaches that will be watching straight away will think about accuracy of the punch where that shot is landing um, and then all the, the technical aspects around that what's going to come next um, where the the athlete is in that particular round in terms of the strategy etc etc but what we're interested in is to strip all that away and boil everything down to its smallest component so then we can build that up and that helps us to reverse engineer performance and look at what contributes to effective performance and identify aspects and parts of the system that we can manipulate through training to then improve performance. So when we're talking about punching and striking in general, what we're talking about is applying a lot of force to a particular target in a short space of time. A punch is delivered in around about 200 milliseconds or even faster. So that's a very, very short time frame in which a boxer has to produce large amounts of force in order to be effective upon impact at the target. Now, what we use to describe or unpick how effective a punch is, is something called the impulse momentum relationship. And this relationship has been used for centuries, hundreds of years. We send space rockets up out into the orbit using this very simple equation, but it's got four parts to it. The, the, the first part describes impulse. And all impulses is the force that's applied over a certain amount of time. 
So when we come to talk about in a, in a few moments time about um, the impact, we can talk about impulse on impact, but you can also talk about producing force over time and producing force quickly. On the other side of the equation, we have mass and velocity, which combined together create momentum. So we can manipulate force and we can manipulate momentum. So when we're talking about ways in which we can manipulate training to improve forcefulness and the effectiveness of a punch, we can look at the variables within this simple equation and try and manipulate them through training. Absolutely. So when we look at like um, developing impulse, we would look to use strength training. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, do that. We can do that either uh, light and fast, or we can do it heavy and slow. And we're going to be talking a little bit about um, like, you know, how we select the different training methods that we use a little bit later on. But mainly we use strength training to try and develop impulse because we're not wanting to improve momentum because we have to put on muscle mass and we're in a, a weight category sport. So the, we're going to go into different ways where we can improve momentum in a, in, a, in a while. But to just go on that strength training, it's not just strength training of, of the upper body or lower body. We look to try and develop that across the full uh, body because uh, a punch is a full body action. It comes from the foot, transferred through uh, the hips, the core, and all the way through to the fist. So we need to be strong all around the body. So this uh, creates our six pillars of strength training, which is squat, hinge, push, pull, core, and then unilateral. So squat is like a squatting exercise, such as like a goblet squat, back squat. This is to get our legs nice and strong, being able to uh, push through the floor, dip down, and really drive into our shots. Then we've got hinge pattern. This is really important to uh, strengthen the posterior chain as that contributes to fast and forceful hip extension. And then we've got upper body push and pull. This is quite um, obvious to, to try and develop because obviously we're, we're propelling the hand forward towards the target and then we're pulling it back into our chin. Whether that's a single shot or combination punches, we need to be all strong around there. And plus, there's high forces going through the punching arm, the upper body, and our, our upper body needs to be strong enough to uh, withstand that. And there's two different areas that we use, uh, pushing and pulling for both. We use horizontal and vertical push and pull. So a horizontal push and pull would be, um, a horizontal push would be a press up or a dumbbell chest press. A pull would be a bent over row or cable row. And then your vertical push and pull. Vertical would be like your overhead press, your uh, push press, your dumbbell, chest, uh, dumbbell shoulder press. And then your pulling would be something like pull ups or cable pull down or lat pull down. And then you've got your core training. This is really vital. And we're going to be talking about this a little bit later on in the podcast because uh, the amount of core mass and trunk muscle mass is the biggest physical contributor to a punching action, but also can uh, is a key member of the kinetic chain of being able to transfer that force from foot through to fist. And there's four different areas that we target uh, there. We'll probably cover that in a later episode. And then we've got our unilateral training where we're basically working on single leg because boxing is done in a split stance. Um, there's a, a strength imbalance and also a mobility imbalance as well. Uh, our, our left hip will look very differently to our right hip based on our split stance being an orthodox or southpaw stance. So it's important that we work on single leg strength. And this is good for not only uh, strength benefits, but also uh, injury prevention benefits as well. So we're talking about mostly impulse there. And we're wanting to get strong. We're wanting to improve maximal strength. Uh, why would boxers want to do that instead of 
just working on fast explosive actions because you just mentioned there that the punch is performed in a blink of an eye under 200 milliseconds. So why would you need to do a heavy deadlift or a heavy squat? So if we go back to the, the physics and we look at this <coughs> equation of the impulse momentum relationship, the equation is FT, which is force and time, equals MV, which is momentum. So if you can produce a lot of force, you can also produce a lot of momentum. Now, a lot of our, in fact, all of pretty much all of our boxers, apart from heavyweights, have a weight restriction. That means we can't manipulate the mass portion of the impulse momentum relationship. So what we can only work on is the speed of an action in that part of the equation. Okay, so now we can add any additional mass. We can contribute to uh, changes in momentum through increase in mass, which would be the most obvious way of doing it. So you get bigger, um, you get more muscle, then you can <coughs> create more momentum in that way. We can't, can't do that. So what we do is we use the force side of the equation, which equals velocity. So if we get stronger and we can apply more force in a short amount of time, then we can improve the velocity of a punch. And as, as we all know, that velocity is critical in terms of performance, not only from a physical perspective, but also from a, a technical and strategic perspective as well, both in the upper body and in the lower body. So by working on strength, we can also have improvements in velocity. And we, know, we also know that athletes who are strong, can also produce a lot of force in a short space of time. And that's been well established for a few years now. So the, the stronger an athlete, the quicker they can produce force. The faster they can produce force, the, the greater the impulse and the greater the velocity of a, a punch or a strike in action. So it's really crucial not only that we spend time, yes, considering velocity, but that foundation of velocity and speed is rooted in forcefulness. Absolutely. And <clears throat> uh, just going off that is that with our more advanced athletes, we do. Uh, just going off that is that with our more advanced athletes, we do work across the load velocity curve where we're working a range of different strength and conditioning methods. Some will be like heavy trap bar deadlifts. And then some might be loaded or unloaded jumps, uh, very punch specific work as well. Um, doing med ball uh, punch throws or landmine punch throws, something like that, something fast and explosive and looking more like the sport. But when an athlete first comes into uh, boxing science, we do a load velocity profile where basically we challenge their ability to produce force and speed at incremental uh, loads and we found with our data is that boxers tend to be more adaptable and, and more able to produce fast speeds at the lighter weights and then that kind of declines as the weight goes up that, that relationship uh, is, is affected so they're not able to produce as much force or as much speed working at that uh, at their maximal loads uh, compared to like your, your rugby players, football players, uh, general kind of strength training populations. And the reason why for this is because boxers don't have that training history. Um, working like with, with uh, strength training, being open to them, uh, maximal training loads. So when they first get into the gym, they're more springy, they're faster, they're more explosive. So that that's kind of the exercises that they can kind of go towards, and that's probably what you see across social media. Um, 
when boxers do strength training, they want it to look more like the sport. They want it to work more explosive because they're in fear of, of weights making them slow. And this is something that I've kind of come across quite a few times, a few uh, Q and A's, you know, do weights make you slow? Is it, is it a myth? And, you know, weights can make you slow if you do it in the wrong way. But we do it at Boxing Science in a very structured way to make a fast and explosive athlete. With that, working towards maximal strength, we don't just get an athlete in and go, right, you need to do three reps on 150 kilos on a trap bar. We have to work them foundations first. So we work around about anywhere between six and 12 repetitions on a uh, developmental exercise. Like I mentioned before, like a goblet squat, maybe a kettlebell deadlift, something that kind of builds their movement and strength foundations. And this is over like a, a longer period of time. So the first block would be anywhere between 10 and 20 weeks, depending on how the athlete is um, adapting to, to the program. And then you'd work on more loaded exercise, more complex exercise, such as like a, if we're working on the squat again, so we'd go from a goblet squat into a barbell box squat. So he's learning uh, the exercise a lot better. He's ingraining the movement foundations, but it's also getting stronger at the same time. We work around about five to eight reps on that. And then we'd start working uh, maximum strength. So this is where we're working anywhere between three and five reps. And sometimes even we go for, for two repetitions and start working on percentage max loading, working anywhere between 85 and 92% uh, one rep max. So that's like kind of the, the journey, what we take our boxers on. It's not just like, right, we're going to get them lifting heavy weights straight away. We've got to build them foundations, improve maximum strength. Once they improve maximum strength and get to a certain level, then we'd look to try and transfer that into faster, more explosive actions. We we're talking about impulse there, Alan. Um, let's talk a little bit about momentum. If, you know, because it's a, a vital thing for producing fast and hard punches, is there any way that we can help increase momentum without increasing our body weight? The best way is to improve strength. So if we can improve our maximum strength, then we can improve the rate at which we then develop force. And if we can improve that rate, then we know that FT, that impulse side of the equation, is related to momentum and velocity. So although we're not changing weight or manipulating the size of, of those active muscles, we can change how quickly those muscles, or th that muscle group, that uh, an anatomical point, whether that's uh, the, the hips or whether that's the, the knees, the ankles or the, the shoulder and the elbow, we can change the speed and the angular speed to improve velocity and, and improve the effectiveness of a, of a punch in, in that respect. Right, so when we look to try and improve momentum, we... When we look to try and improve momentum, we use a term uh, effective mass, which is like the, the snap of the punch, which is like a, a full body tension on, on bit on impact. So if you think about if you're uh, punching a bag, if your arms floppy, your fist isn't clenched as hard, you're not going to have that same impact that you would do if all your arms tense at the same time. And that's a, that's a skill. But also we can try and improve that with uh, getting stronger, uh, improving our core strength, our upper body strength as well. But also we can uh, work on like very technical strength and conditioning exercises, such as like a landmine punch with an isometric hold at the end, or uh, a load of different isometric exercises as well. We're talking about all this, uh, all these different kind of training methods, but there's a lot of limitations in there as well. So when we're talking about using a deadlift or a back squat, or maybe like Olympic lifting as well, your, your general kind of 
uh, go-to exercises for strength and conditioning. In boxing, we're quite limited because we're talking about that strength training history. There's a lot of boxing training history there and a lot of kind of movement issues created by that. So we tested the England boxing uh, youth squads. We tested around about 90 boxers and we uh, did an overhead squat. So this is a great uh, movement assessment for uh, hip mobility, shoulder mobility, core stability. It gives us a general overview of what's tight and what may be underactive. And what we found was that about 30 or 40% of athletes had tight hips and then 66% had tight shoulders. And Alan, your, your doctor, you're the, um, the mad scientist, if 66% of a population have got tight shoulders, that's quite high in, in terms of research. Likely be uh, a significant, statistically significant finding, but also meaningful as well. That's, that's nothing to be sniffed out there. That's a, a large proportion of the sample, which is representative of a large part of the, the whole sport, not just in the nation, but, but worldwide. And, and probably not just boxing neither, probably a lot of striking sports that would have or display these limitations. And what we want our athletes to to be also good at is like you say transmitting force from foot to fist because let's let's take um let's take a journey of of where we've been at so far so when we create force to punch that force comes from the lower body so that's why it's a, it comes from the fist that force generation that comes from the lower body where we get that ground reaction force is then transmitted through the kinetic chain okay then it gets to our hips, it gets to our core. Now, for a lot of our um, our boxers, we know that they they have imbalances in their core strength, um, which is one limitation and, and weakness there. Around their hips, we know they've got limited movements around the hips. And we also know there's limitations in thoracic mobility and, and their rotation. So there's also some some weaknesses in the in the kinetic chain there as well. So despite producing quite large amounts of force in the lower body, if that force is traveling through the kinetic chain and then we're losing some of that force around that core, then we're limiting the amount of force transference, which will then mean with we're transferring less force into our upper body. And ultimately, there will be less opportunity to apply force on impact. So we've talked about the impulse momentum relationship in terms of producing force to change the speed of essentially the fist heading towards a physical target. But then on impact, we get a, a stiffening. And this is a, a fairly underappreciated concept or phenomena in combat sports. Apart from coaches and athletes might understand this as the snap in a punch. So we've not only got impulse trans being transmitted throughout the body, we've also got impulse being transmitted on impact as well. So we've got a stiffening. So we have a relaxation during the punch and then we have a stiffening on impact as well. Now, you mentioned a few moments ago, Danny, some of those exercises which you can use to improve that snap of the punch and that's really important and that's a different type of muscle action compared to the concentric actions that we've used to to generate that force to generate that speed of the fist this is now an isometric contraction so that's another different type of muscle activity in a different position that we've got to consider to then transfer over into strength training so not only have we got the force that's being generated in the lower body. We've then got the force and the potential movement restrictions we have in uh, the core and the core strength and mobility, rotational ability. And then possibly the skill element of directing all that force to move 
the fist into the correct location at the right time in a very short space of time and then produce another huge amount of force on impact in a very short space of time and then get out of the way and, and not get hit. So there's a huge amount of physical attributes, physical skill going into a punch and you can see how you can, you can break that punch down into its components and isolate them and think about ways in which you can train each component differently. Uh, and, and that's what we've, we, we try and do with in the science behind the punch is, is look at those components and try and incorporate strength training, training practices to work on some of those limitations that, that we know boxers and combat athletes have, but also work on those strengths as well that we know are large contributors to performance. So understanding the science, understanding the, the basic physics is really, really important. It's, it's fine to look at the contemporary science, but we probably still don't have a great understanding of how force is produced and transmitted. And what we're using here is, is first principles rather than uh, empirical evidence that we have collected in the lab to inform our practice here. So in terms of the, the research underpinning that, yes, there is some research out there, but there's not a great deal. And this, I wouldn't necessarily say there's a, a consensus. So what we're trying to do is still trying to unpack performance, uh, look at it in its constituent parts and try and build our training philosophy, philosophy upon well-grounded first principles, which I think is a, a very important consideration in any sport that you're in trying to reverse engineer it, unpick what makes people successful or the first principles that contribute to performance and then build the training philosophy around that. Yeah, absolutely. Any kind of um, uni like university student or former university student listening to this will know the, the importance of a, a needs analysis. And this is basically an overview of the needs analysis that, that we did when we first getting into uh, boxing. The one thing that he said there about uh, the relaxation part, this is a, a key component of delivering a fast and forceful punch, but it doesn't really sit well into maximum strength training because they're used to really exploding, relaxing, and then reproducing that force at the end. So a lot of the boxers that we train with uh, struggle with the, the sticking point of, a, of an exercise. What I mean by the sticking point is halfway through the, the movement, so let's say a squat for example, halfway up through the squat they'll lose that acceleration that they got from the uh, bottom, that uh, original kind of concentric action because they're not used to grinding uh, through that movement. So this limits the different kinds of exercises that we can expose our athletes to. And going back onto them, movement limitations, being tight in the shoulders, that this um, limits the different exercises that a boxer can do. So we mentioned about Olympic lifting. You need really good shoulder mobility. Uh, you need to be strong in your wrists and elbows uh, and, and mobile in your wrists and elbows to be able to be an effective Olympic lifter. Um, if you haven't got that, that will um, limit the amount of load that you can lift and will increase the likelihood of you getting injured from that. And that's the last thing that we want to do. We want to make sure that our uh, training methods are safe and they're effective and working towards that adaptation. One of the most common questions that I get across social media is what kind of deadlift should I use? Because a lot of the deadlifts that we post on Boxing Science is the trap bar deadlift. And we opt towards doing the trap bar deadlift more than the straight bar deadlift because you're in a more neutral grip. It's uh, more shoulder friendly. So there's less rounding of the upper back, uh, which makes you more able to lift more load. So then you can get stronger, but will also maintain a good posture. So it's also friendly on your, on your lower back. So that's the main thing that we do. We make... Uh, exercises safer and more effective 
are working towards the purpose of the exercise without getting our athletes injured. Um, one thing that we've, we've mentioned, Al, a few times, but we haven't really gone into it, is the, uh, the, the amount of core mass and trunk, uh, trunk mass um, being the biggest physical contributor to a punch. Do you want to explain a little bit more how we found uh, that data out? Yeah, basically, during your MSC, I made you test loads and loads of things and, and look at the relationships. <laughs> uh, I've done this, right, look at this instead. I've done that, right, okay, look at this instead. But um, so way back years and years ago, when you did your master's dissertation, we had um, two different types of, of tests in there. One was a, a, a med ball throw from the backhand stance on, on uh, the right and left sides. And the other was a, an assessment of body composition. Now, we're lucky enough to have a, a segmental body composition analyzer in the labs. So we can look at the amount of lean tissue in the right arm, the left arm, right leg, left leg, but also the core as well. So one of the analysis that that you did was you looked at what the physical contributors might be to someone throwing that med ball far. And again, if we apply impulse momentum relationship to, to that test, if you can throw that medicine ball far, it's likely that you're producing a lot of force that will then contribute to velocity and that velocity of the the ball at release will determine let's take away the angle let's say you've got an optimum angle on there will determine how far that ball is thrown so if you can produce a lot of force you can produce a lot of hand speed that hand speed will then translate into how far you can throw that ball let's just say there's an optimum angle there and angle of release doesn't doesn't matter in, in this particular example so what we were interested in is okay what so we know that's important we know that's important from a a, a theoretical perspective we also know it's important from a practical perspective with the med ball throw and the better athletes were able to or the better the better boxers were able to throw that ball further um i think kel brook holds the record doesn't he so he holds he holds the record for the uh the landmine punch throw. Yeah. Not, not, yeah. not the, uh, not the ball. I don't think he's uh, done many ball sports before. Uh, when he put med ball in his hand to throw it, he just, he didn't know <laughs> what was happening. But I tell you what, that landmine punch throw that he did, I'll never forget how red my hands were after that. <laughs> so that um, the landmine punch throw test is is an advancement then that we've made to the to the med ball test, and we'll probably come on to that in in a few episodes time probably. But we we're okay. So well, then we're looking at okay relationships um, between body composition and performance in that throw test, um, and we looked at a range of of different um, aspects to body composition. But one of the relationships that that we found that had uh, a strong relationship, one that explained a lot of the performance in that med ball test was relative core mass and at that point when we had found that relationship was like okay core strength core mass um is very important to be able to uh, punch effectively and that has also formed part of our training philosophy so what we've done is we've taken performance measures and science underpinning that performance measure uh, and some practical elements of it to make it look like a striking punching action from the backhand. And then we've taken the body composition and, and science around that body composition uh, assessment and segmental analysis, and we've applied statistical methods of investigation to determine what we think is a good contributor to performance and that is core mass, relative core mass, relative core strength. That is why it forms such an integral part of our training philosophy. 
Yeah, and we look to try and develop this core mass in uh, various ways, mainly through compound lifts, such as your squat and your deadlifts, but also we need to look at more isolated exercises as well. Uh, so we develop the core uh, using our four pillars, uh, pillars, sorry, um, from the, which were inspired by uh, Mike Robinson's um, 21st century core training, which is basically the four key movements of, of the spine. There's lateral flexion, extension, hip, fle uh, hip flexion, and also uh, rotation. But we look to resist that. So we put an ante on top of all of them, not anti is in terms of a <laughs> uh, relative, anti-lateral flexion, anti-extension, anti-rotation. So we're, we're limiting that, that we're, we're limiting and controlling them actions. And we take a very similar approach to our core training that we would do our, stre our normal strength training. We look to try and build them foundations and then work towards more dynamic exercises. So we go for stability and endurance, basically challenging anti-rotation, anti-extension through static exercises. This can be like a plank, side plank, or pull off press. And then we look to try and challenge that stability uh, through movement. So we're still resisting that extension of the spine or rotation of the spine, but we're actually moving at the same time. So I'll use the example for, for anti-rotation. That would be like a cable rotation. We're still moving, but we're resisting that rotation when we're coming back. We're not over-rotating. And then we look to like do a more dynamic exercise. This is where you'll see your med ball throws. And this is basically uh, improving rotational force and uh, improving the stretch shortening cycle of the core to help that express that force through the kinetic chain through to the fist. So like we just said there, Al, it's all about creating uh, them foundations and then being able to to transfer that into a punching action. It's a great area to kind of cover, but where do you see like kind of strength training sitting in importance um, in terms of a full boxing training camp? You know, surely like the boxing training, sparring, conditioning all come before that. And what do we need to do to make sure that we don't impact uh, them other areas of, of training performance? Yeah, absolutely. It's, you've got to think of this um, as the uh, in in respect to the whole program, and it's got to integrate. Strength training has got to integrate with all the moving parts. Um, it is important, but it, if you were to to rank the importance of 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 these things, then it's it's not it's not top of top of the the list. However it is very important to build those foundations, not only to enhance performance, but also to build that level of robustness and resilience as well, uh, to prevent injury, to improve mobility, um, and in those ways to improve performance. Um, what we've got to do from a S&C perspective is try to understand the concerns that people have over strength training and for example weights make you slow is still still used today even today and the evidence is clear weights do not make you slow unless you're training slow so if if that if the if the movements that you're performing in strength training are slow, then you train a slow movement. However, if you're training with intent, so the movement might look slow if you're near maximal effort. The intent, however, is very forceful. Yeah, you're increasing that force production, which will then turn into rate of force development. But if you're doing slow bicep curls on five kilos, that isn't going to transfer as well. Yeah, exactly. So it's all about remember what we're what we often think about as well is just the muscles, and we don't think about 
the neuromuscular pathways prior to activation of that muscle. So you might look at something and say, oh, oh they're moving that slow, but what you what somebody might miss is, okay, well, that's, that's close to their 1RM. So they're activating a lot of high threshold motor units through uh, near fall activation and uh, recruitment of the whole muscle group, not just the ones that you've probably activated neither, those assistance muscle groups as well. So I think it, 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 it's really important that as a community of strength and conditioning coaches that we all have a responsibility to, to try and get the message across that strength training is, is really important and is integral to combat sports for injury pre prevention, resilience, robustness, and also for performance as well. Yeah, it's a key piece of the jigsaw, but that's what you've got to you've got to think about as well. That it is a piece of the jigsaw uh, strength training, and that should like kind of uh, help structure your program as working around the different aspects of of training as well. Uh, I think that's a great way to to finish off. Just to kind of round up, I want to share what our strength training uh, philosophy is. We've kind of talked about it for the last uh, forty five minutes or so. But just to summarise, we've got this great slide that we, uh, we feature in our articles, we've put it on social media, it's also part of our Science Behind Boxing uh, ebook. And basically, our, our strength training philosophy is to increase the rate of force development of the upper and lower body, look to try and do that in a range of different strength and conditioning methods, look to try and retain and increase trunk muscle mass, so it's, we've seen that relative muscle mass of the core is the biggest contributor to a punch. So when an athlete is making weight, we want to try and retain as much trunk mass as possible. With our training, we want to limit the amount of fatigue. So that's, that can have a big effect on our ability to run fast, run for longer, being able to spar to the best of our abilities. So we don't want our strength training to have an impact on the other areas of boxing. We also want to limit hypertrophy. We don't want to be putting on muscle mass. We don't want to be doing slow reps, which is basically working towards that myth of, or it actually isn't a myth of, of weights making you slow. We've got to work around uh, the limitations of what boxing presents. So the high boxing training loads but also the, uh, the movement limitations as well, they're tight around the shoulders, tight around the hips. We've got to find different ways that we can improve the safety and the effectiveness of each strength and conditioning method that we uh, select. Then we need to transfer it to the punch. We're talking about um, transferring that force through the kinetic chain from foot to hip, uh, through the core and through to the fist. So we need to make sure that we're working across the load velocity uh, profile, working from uh, high load, slow movement actions that will increase the amount of force that you're able to produce. But then we need to be able to express that into fast explosive actions and uh, sequence that all together through into a punching action. That's why you'll see a lot of our, on our social media, we do a lot of that, especially with our more advanced athletes. Alan, just to finish off, what what do we need to improve in strength and conditioning at the moment in terms of uh, research or application? What are the things that you're seeing that uh, strength and conditioning coaches need to take note of? Um, I think and this is important for, uh, for every coach is, is to have uh, a philosophy of training that's rooted in evidence scientific evidence not just an observation observations are important so if, for example an observation you look at the sport and you look at the movement and uh, movement profiles and activity profiles of, of that sport and you try and replicate that i think it's important that all snc coaches have a philosophical um strategy um, approach to training that is based upon first principles 
So looking, like I said, looking at the, the contemporary scientific research is absolutely fine, but strip it all back and look at the very, very basics of performance um, and try and reverse engineer it as, as much as possible. And then you can start to, to build a philosophy from that. Having said that, I still, and I've mentioned this a few times already, we still don't have a great understanding of how those first principles translate into performance because boxing performance, combat sport performance is very dynamic, complex, variable. It's hard to control in the laboratory. Um, we don't have uh, a great understanding of how strength training translates to the true effectiveness of a, of a punch, primarily because we do lack the um, access to the technology that can assess punching force. So like a, a, a wall mounted um, force plate, for example, which would be gold standard, but also how that force then translates to accuracy. So we, somebody can punch one of these force plates um, or a dynamometer as hard as they like, but how does that force then translate when you've got a moving target or, or even um, if you're asked to uh, produce force in a random way um, to react to that as well. So there's, there's lots of different ways in which the effectiveness of a punch can be assessed, but we've, we've still not got um, a good understanding of that, um, primarily because the, the technology, the, the gold standard technology that we would use in biomechanics research is, is not as readily available as it could be. It's hard work to set it up. Uh, and there are only a few researchers that are actually trying to investigate that. And we made um, a decision a long time ago to focus on preparing athletes for competition rather than looking at the research uh, and investigating the re research per se on what contributes to an effective punch because we think we can make more of an impact in that way than we, than we can producing research on what makes a, a forceful and effective punch and we'll wait and we'll work with the clever people that are in the biomechanics lab doing the, the hard work to do this and then we will then translate into performance. There's so many different aspects to a hard punch. Um, if you get a punch dynamometer, it's all about the, the timing, the speed, uh, the amount of effort that, that boxer's willing to put into um, punch that dynamometer as, as fast and as hard as possible. And when you're actually in the, in the boxing ring, how often do you get to kind of wind one up? It's all about timing and, and accuracy as well. So it's, it's hard to get a, a true understanding but I think that we've got that scientific kind of basis to have, have like some strong evidence that can what we need to do to work towards that. And I think I think that's good enough. It's never going to be uh, perfect. And there's something that I want to um, I want to finish on. Um, I did a podcast the other day with uh, Matt, Matthew Smiley from uh, Fatality PT. Uh, on his podcast, he asked me, what are the non-negotiable exercises? I expected me to say trap bar deadlift or power clean or whatever. And I said, there isn't anything that's non-negotiable. What is non-negotiable is creating your system and working towards adaptations and keep working towards the purpose. And we've got a very defined purpose and we've defined, uh, defined that purpose and shared it with you on this podcast. And everything is filtered towards that, depending on the equipment that's available to you, uh, the limited movement limitations and the training history of that athlete, and the time frame that you're working on as well, and what your goals are. But we're always working towards this kind of this uh, this uh, working frame of the science behind the punch, developing a lot of force in a short amount of time. Our six pillars of performance. We're looking to not affect uh, boxing training, and I think a lot of people listening to this might be thinking, right, this works well for me, or they might want to develop their own system. I think that's really important as well. 
you, ca you can't just go on a course and then just pick up all the boxing science methods. You've got to be comfortable in taking a few bits of what we're saying and start putting it into your own training philosophy. You know, you don't have to be get working towards them gold stand standard exercises or have non-negotiable exercises, but make sure that you define your strategy and your purpose of your training for the athletes and, and for you as a coach as well. Mm. Great. What a great answer that is, mate. Fantastic answer. A fantastic answer to my own question that I've just made. <laughs> Train the adaptation, not the exercise. And those... And those adaptations will be rooted in your philosophy as a as a coach. I tell you what, we've covered some great information there. I think we've only just skinned the surface. So, uh, if anybody's wanting to know anything more about uh, some of the training methods that we use at Boxing Science, please hit the subscribe button. We'll be going in more depth into these particular areas that we talked about. You know, talking about the load, velo uh, the load velocity profile, talking about core training, talking about what kind of lower body exercises that we'll use. We'll go into more in-depth podcasts in the near future. But if you can't wait for that, check out the Boxing Science membership where we've got full workshops of explaining why we use it and how to apply that. And, and some, of the, some of the good uh, workshops on there is where I'm basically taking an athlete from when they first walk in to the gym and taking them through a journey of how to squat better, how to deadlift better, how to, how to perform pressing exercises better as well. Uh, some real detailed coaching and some coaching progressions in there as well. So Boxing Science membership is a seven day free trial at the moment, boxingscience.co.uk and then it's just £8.99 a month and there's loads of different content on there. Um, different workshops and we've also just opened up our lockdown workout section where we're um, sharing different kinds of workouts that you can implement at home. Most of the videos are done in my uh, three by three squared patio and basically showing you how you can adapt these training methods uh, still working towards the purpose of working towards that science behind the punch. So. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, please hit subscribe. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Alan, for joining. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode.